Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you all for being here and welcome. Um, we are here for the latest installment of, of, our, of, our, of, of the iDiscs uh, series on metadata scientists. Uh, more about that in a second. My name is Ken Goodman. I, I uh, am responsible for the data sciences program in data ethics and society, uh, university ethics programs and the Institute for Bioethics and Health Policy. And it's my privilege today uh, to welcome a colleague, Lindsay Thomas, uh, uh, on the topic or with the title, When Are Texts Data? Views from a Data Humanist. Uh, so, so Professor Dr. Thomas uh, is, is um, a, in, in the Department of English. Um, she's a co-director of What Everyone Says, a project that employs machine learning techniques to examine discourse about the humanities on a large scale. And it makes clear for the sake of IDIS, the Institute for Data Science and Computing, that, that its mission ranges across the University of Miami. So Professor Cineramus is there. Uh, he's in Coral Gables maybe, but he's an appointment in the medical school, but the co-director is Ben Kurtman from Rasmus. Uh, and it is one of the few really, uh, by my lights anyway, successful inter-campus activities that we have. For those of you who know the University of Miami, it has three campuses, some of which seem like they're on three different planets. In any case, uh, the, the, the floor is going, to be, is going to be for Dr. Thomas. Uh, I, you have some slides that I think that are ready to go. And I think with no further ado, uh, I will hand the baton to you. The floor is yours, Lindsay. All right, great. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I wanna thank uh, IDESC, uh, Ken and Nick and Janina for um, having me here today and for organizing this event. And thanks to you all for coming. Um, so I want to just briefly, uh, oh, oh I, one more thing to say is um, if you have a question um, as I'm talking, um, I'm, I'm happy to try to answer it. I, I, I can't see all of you on my screen. Um, and so if you um, either speak up or do the raise hand uh, function, um, I, I'll, I hope we'll be able to see that um, or hear that. And then there will also be time at the, after I talk for a discussion. Um, so we'll have that time as well. Um, so I, I want to begin by talking a little, about, a, a little bit about my title. I'm going to be focusing today on how scholars in the humanities think about data and how they use data in their work, specifically work that focuses on texts and textual interpretation. Humanities scholars deal with all kinds of materials, not just text, of course, but one of my areas of expertise is computational text analysis, text mining, there are many ways to describe it, or what's often called cultural analytics in my field. And so that's what I'll be focusing on in later parts of the talk. The title of this series, as you know, is Meet a Data Scientist, but my talk is also subtitled Views from a Data Humanist. Why? I think part of that is I have some discomfort myself with presenting myself as a data scientist because my methods are pretty simple and I'm not at all trained as a scientist. I'm a humanist. A lot of what I'm going to talk about today is not necessarily what is often goes under the banner of data science. I've also switched out data humanist for data scientist because a lot of my, uh, a lot of my work is engaged with thinking about the differences and similarities between the humanities and the sciences as large concepts in public discourse. And in using methods um, in data collection and analysis or methods in the data humanities, if you will, to learn more about how people think about these differences and how they discuss them. Um, okay, so the, the structure of what I'm gonna talk about today. First, I'm gonna briefly talk a little bit about myself, um, about my research background, in the second part of the talk, I'm going to give a really brief overview of how humanists approach data, specifically textual data, and give a sort of quick sense of some cool stuff that's happening in the area of the data humanities right now. And then the third part of the talk, I'm going to, uh, the, the part of the talk that I'm going to spend the most time on, I'm going to talk about some of my own work on the What Everyone Says project, which was, as Ken said, a multi-institutional public humanities project that investigated public perceptions of the humanities by examining how the humanities are discussed in contemporary news and social media discourse. Okay, so about me. My training is in English. I got a PhD from UC Santa Barbara in 2014. My BA was also in English and in Spanish and I have an MA in English. So it's English all the way down. Um, before coming to UM, I, trained, I worked at Clemson University for two years immediately following my PhD. And then I got the job here in the English department in 2016. My areas of specialization include contemporary US literary and cultural studies, as well as what we can broadly refer to as computational research methods. Um, I teach classes in at the undergrad level in contemporary US literature, US literature since 1945, contemporary queer theory and literature, 
Um, and also at the undergrad and the grad level, a, a field that's again, sort of often described as the digital humanities or sort of computational approaches to literary studies. Um, my first book just came out in March. It's called Training for Catastrophe. It focuses, uh, Training for Catastrophe, Fictions of National Security After 9-11. It focuses on uh, post 9-11 US national security materials and how they use fiction to train people to think about disaster in particular ways. Um, I've also published articles on contemporary science fiction, disease surveillance systems, and on length, the concept and idea of length as an important and sort of overlooked idea in literary studies. So I rely on my training in literary and cultural studies a lot in all of my work, obviously. Um, I examine a lot of digital materials in my book, but I do so in ways that are sort of broadly interpretive and theoretical, and that many scholars in literary and cultural studies would immediately recognize as like normal or dare I say traditional in the field. But other aspects of my work are less traditional. Again, I don't like using that word, but we'll use it for now. Um, I also specialize in what's often, again, the digital humanities computational approaches or using digital tools and methods to discuss and examine traditional objects of humanistic inquiry. I've worked on a variety of collaborative DH projects in my time starting in graduate school, but I wanna focus on one in particular because I ended up working on it for many years and I'll talk about it again at the end in the third part of the talk. Um, this was the What Everyone Says project. We began a pilot phase of this project when I was still a graduate student in 2013. And then in 2017, we received a grant from the Mellon Foundation, um, which we actually just wrapped up in June. Um, it was a multi-institutional project based at three institutions. So it was at UM, at University of California, Santa Barbara, where I got my PhD, and then at California State University, Northridge in LA. Um, the project was, uh, well, uh, um, about, well, I should say first that over the years, we had over um, 100 people work in various capacities on this project. And I managed a research team of anywhere from three to six research assistants, um, graduate research assistants here at UM over a, a period of each year, over a period of about three and a half years. Um, as I said, the project was about investigating contemporary public discourse about the humanities. Um, our methods include machine, uh, included machine learning, but it also had an um, ethnographic component. So we collected over 9 million documents uh, from LexisNexis, which is a um, corporation that owns a lot of newspaper article data. Um, we collected from them as well as TV news transcripts and social media sources such as Twitter and Reddit. And we use text analysis and machine learning, mainly focusing on topic modeling, which is a sort of automated way of detecting themes or topics within large bodies of text and on sort of just simple text classification, automatic ways of sorting text into different categories or groups um, to, to come to a lot of our conclusions. Uh, the project also had an ethnographic dimension. So we surveyed and held focus group discussions pre-COVID with members of the UC Santa Barbara and U University of Miami campus communities. And we asked them to talk about their opinions about the humanities. And so we were comparing sort of conclusions that we came to with this large scale text analysis to local thoughts and opinions on university campuses. Um, I'm gonna, as I said, talk more about uh, this project, my role on it and some of the research that has come out of it in the third part of the talk. But before I do that, I wanna give a sense of how my work fits in with other, uh, other work that humanists are doing with data. Much of my DH work and a lot of computational work in the humanities in general is collaborative. Um, however, the humanities do not necessarily have a long or a widespread tradition of collaborative work. Of course, there are exceptions to this, but generally speaking, the humanities aren't structured around collaboration. Outside of the digital humanities, collaborative work is still somewhat unusual and difficult to manage in many of the humanities disciplines. So all of our hiring standards in the humanities, our tenure and promotion guidelines are all built around the idea of a sort of lone scholar doing independent research and being a singular author. Another issue facing those who want to do this type of work in the humanities is a lack of formal training. I learned all of the technical skills that I needed uh, to do my work um, sort of on the job. These have included things like database design and management in multiple languages, web design, data management and curation and collection and scraping, including things I need to know about metadata and bibliographic uh, data standards and methods in text mining, 
as well as the math and the programming skills that make it possible to do all of these things. I learned all this in a sort of ad hoc, informal, on the job manner. As I said, I was my training is English all the way down. So it's hard for many humanities scholars and students to access formal training in many of these things. Most grad programs and most undergrad programs don't build this kind of training into their curriculum and it occurs informally. So we're, what I'm saying here is that we're early days in um, thinking about uh, this type of sort of data science or data humanities work in the humanities. Um, a final issue is how many humanities departments and humanists themselves conceive of their work. I, I sort of hate to make general proclamations about whole fields because they're always wrong, but I'm gonna hazard one anyway for the sake of sort of illustrating my point. Um, although work with data in the humanities goes back as far as modern humanities departments do, so back to the early 20th century in the United States, many humanities fields and many of those people in the humanities understand our work to be something that is very different from the more empirical outlook and quantitative methods that often characterize work with data, broadly speaking. Again, I'm speaking here in very broad generalizations, and I think the divide I'm describing is largely artificial, but in many humanities fields, nevertheless, particularly my own of literary studies, we've, pried, um, we've prized interpretation and historical analysis of relatively small groups of texts in a detailed and thorough way. So you're reading them with your own eyes, um, but in a way that's also primarily subjective and for lack of a better term, literary. Despite all of this, there is a ton of awesome work happening right now in the humanities that is about and that is using data, specifically textual data. The field is growing. So I'm gonna briefly sort of survey three larger areas or domains, if you will, where humanists are doing work about or using data. These are not the only areas in which this work is happening, but these areas are each important for understanding the unique perspective and capabilities of the data humanities. So the first area is what I'm broadly call it, calling uh, data cultures or the histories and politics of data. So um, you can see I've sort of included uh, questions grouped into particular sort of conceptual ways on the slide. So the question that's um, in, in that first bullet point there what are some of the histories of data as a concept and of data collection as a practice? There's been a lot of work done on this in the past 20 years, including work on medieval and early modern disease, morbidity and mortality records and how that history influenced uh, practices of data collection and continues to do so today. There's been a lot of work on 18th and 19th century, uh, the 18th and 19th century transatlantic slave trade and how its attendant practices of data collection and organization supported ideas about the you know, non-humanity or the dehumanization of people, call, people of African descent. Um, the second bullet point is a, uh, deals with questions related to the history of science and history of science approaches that focus on the rhetoric of objectivity surrounding data and the deep historical relationship of data to the study of rhetoric itself, um, as well as the development of data as a concept, as an independent concept in the 18th century and its relationship to facts and interpretation. The third bullet point is a, a question about um, the consequences of data collection. And the image that you see on the slide is a cover of a recent book by scholars Catherine D'Ignazio and Lauren F. Klein um, that seeks to investigate uh, how sort of seemingly simple things like, for example, organizing demographic data by binary gender affects how we think about gender itself and excludes or hides from view people whose genders are not binary. So the next broad area of the data humanities is what I'm calling sort of archiving and data curation. Um, the, the first uh, bullet point, this is about preserving and making digital versions of text and other objects accessible. Um, and that first bullet point there is uh, questions that are concerning sort of uh, things like accessibility. How do we make um, hard to access print text available online and how do we preserve them? There have been a number of long running sort of digital archives in literary studies. The Walt Whitman archive and the Emily Dickinson archive are two um, sort of canonical examples where um, the scholars who run these archives have made not only the poetry of Whitman and Dickinson accessible online, but also things like their letters, um, any sort of other writing they may have written all collected together in the same place. Um, and so this, this type of work has a long tradition in the humanities and scholars have started doing it online, you know, 30 years ago now. The second bullet point um, concerns questions of 
um, how do we, how, how are we thinking about archives and what archives are? A project that I think does a really good job of posing these questions and of trying to answer them through the construction and presentation of the archive itself is the image you see on the slide there, the Early Caribbean Digital Archive or the ECDA, which is run out of Northeastern University up in Boston. This is a collection of sort of pre 20th century Caribbean texts, maps and images that have, um, that are brought together for the first time as a single collection through this archive. And here I'm just gonna quote from the website. They write, the materials in the archive are primarily authored and published by Europeans, but the ECDA aims to use digital tools to remix the archive and foreground the centrality and creativity of the enslaved and free African, Afro-Creole and indigenous peoples in the Caribbean world. This is, I think, is an example of an archive that's thinking explicitly about how archives themselves get constructed and how they carry forward legacies of white supremacy and colonialism. And finally, the third data point. Here I'm moving from archives to data sets. There's a lot to say about the differences between the two, but one of the main differences is that, of course, data sets are about organizing materials in computationally tractable ways, whereas archives may not have that as their main focus. In the past five years, and it's really quite new in literary studies, we have seen the advent of literary studies focused data repositories like the Post 45 Data Collective, which I've linked to here, which is based out of Emory University, which peer reviews and houses literary uh, data on the post 1945 period in an open access website so that other scholars and students can, can use it. And finally, the third area I wanna talk about is cultural analytics. This is about using data to answer questions about culture. And this is really where I see a lot of my work um, is falling under this rubric. Um, and so the question on, under the first bullet point is, is about what happens when we expand the scope of our research questions in the humanities? What happens when we examine over 300 or even a thousand novels stretching over the course of a hundred years instead of focusing on just 10 or 15 novels? What do we learn through this expansion? Computational tools and methods make it possible for scholars to examine cultural production at a larger scale than is feasible with more traditional or non-computational methods in the humanities. And the second bullet point is, uh, this question is about, um, as this question makes clear, this sort of reframing of the scope of our scholarship can change our understanding of particular historical periods. I think a book that shows this really well is Richard Jean So's recent book, Red Lighting Culture, A Data History of Racial Inequality in Post-War Fiction. By collecting and analyzing data on the US publishing industry in the second half of the 20th century, so 1950 to 2000, so demonstrates that the publishing industry during this time was significantly wider than literary scholars have understood in the past. So he, he finds that 97% of novels published by Random House, which is the largest post-war US publisher, um, were, were published by white authors, 97% between 1950 and 2000. I think as literary scholars, of American fiction, we have an understanding of the whiteness of US publishing, but so really makes that, um, puts, a, puts a finer point on that. So also includes a lot more complicated data analysis than just sort of simple counting, but the book demonstrates broadly what is possible to achieve using cultural analytics approaches. Okay, so now I wanna move to the, the third part of my talk, which is gonna be about my research on the What Everyone Says project. Um, as I said at the top of this talk, what everyone says was a project focused on examining contemporary public discourse about the humanities. Um, the project included a huge data collection and curation component. Um, as I said, we ended up collecting more than 9 million documents from contemporary news and social media sources. Talking about the data collection component would be a, a whole other talk. And so I've, I've included a link here um, where you can go to our website and learn more about our data sets. Um, and you can find links there to our data sets on Zenodo. There are, several, there are many different data sets that we collected. The project also included a huge open science software component. We created a system that other humanities scholars can use to replicate our processes um, by using our data and or by inserting data of their own and using our methods to do something else. Um, so I've also included a, a link there to um, where our, we call them our workspace templates are stored on Zenodo and you can um, get those from GitHub and you can see the types of analyses that we've done. Um, as I said, talking about these aspects of the project would each require their own presentation. 
So I'm gonna, I want to shift now to focusing on some of our findings, although the sort of data collection and curation and open science software aspect of the project was a, a lot of what I worked on. Okay, so the findings that I discuss are largely going to be drawn from a forthcoming article that I co-authored with one of the project's postdoctoral scholars. You can see circled on this slide, Abigail Droge, um, who's now at Purdue University. Um, this article is going to be coming out in the, culture, the Journal of Cultural Analytics, hopefully by the end of this year or early next year. It's an open access online journal. But I do want to emphasize that, as you can see on this slide, the work on this project was deeply collaborative and involved many, many people at three across three different institutions. This slide shows a list of the names of people who worked as RAs on the project over the course of three years. So the findings I'm about to discuss are also based in a really foundational way on work that these people performed. So um, the article that we have written is called The Humanities in Public. Um, it's, uh, as I said, coming out in the Journal of Cultural Analytics soon. Um, the first cell on the top right there about uh, data, um, the, art the data that we focused on this article in this article on was a, a small subset of the what everyone says or the WUNS data. We looked at 147,000-ish documents from two, 624 unique mainstream and student newspaper sources from across the United States published during the years 1998 to 2018. Now, when I say the words mainstream newspaper, I'm referring to the 15 top circulating papers as of 2019. So sources like the New York Times, Washington Post, USA Today, Dallas Morning News, Minneapolis Star Tribune, et cetera. Campus newspapers refers to newspapers located on a college or a university campus in the US and run by students. And we collected all of this data from LexisNexis. Um, the data that we uh, were looking at was data that we had collected via a keyword search, which was required for LexisNexis. And the data that we focused on for this article were documents containing the words humanities, liberal arts, science, and sciences. And I'll talk a bit about those keywords uh, in, a, in a second. So uh, our methods in this piece, they're very, very simple. As I said, um, we do things as simple as just counting things that had never been counted before. Do some simple hypothesis testing. We discover a lot by doing this sort of quick and easy type of quantification. Um, we also rely on supervised and unsupervised modeling and some word frequency comparisons. Specifically, we do a bunch of Wilcox and rank sum tests. And then the third cell here is talking about our, our questions. One of our motivating questions for this piece had to do with the fact that academic scholarship and discussion of the humanities often follows predictable patterns and has for decades. One of these patterns is that when humanists, academic humanists, tend to, to write about the humanities, um, they tend to do so in the framework of talking about the humanities crisis and how everything is going downhill. We don't doubt that the humanities and other areas of basic research, including many natural and social sciences, are in crisis. But we wanted to see as researchers what other ways of talking about the humanities exist. We wanted to think about um, what discussion of the humanities would look like if we focused not on academic articles or on books or even on op-eds written by academics, but rather just on sort of everyday common boring news articles that happen to contain the word humanities, for example. Um, another one of our motivating questions is that um, there's been a lot of discussion in the past 10 years or so, 20 years about the value of the public humanities. We were interested in thinking about how examining the term humanities and how that term appears in everyday news discourse, everyday public venues, such as newspapers, how would this change how we understand what the public humanities are more broadly? Of course, there isn't just one definition of the public humanities, but it refers broadly to initiatives designed to make humanities scholarship accessible to wider publics or to create public events, programming, exhibits, et cetera, that build on or are inspired or influenced by humanities scholarship. Um, it, it's about, generally speaking, sort of communicating more directly with the public and not just other academics. But again, we want to see how what happens if we look at newspapers? Um, what happens to this, to our understanding of this term, the public humanities? What happens when we focus not on a definition 
of the term humanities, but rather on how the term humanities behaves in this context, which I'll be talking about here. Okay, so in order to zero in on public discourse specifically about the humanities or about science and about science, we built classifiers designed to predict if a newspaper article is about the humanities or if it's about science. Um, and those, these, this, these were non-exclusive classification categories, but it was a pretty simple classification experiment. For our purposes, an article about the humanities or science was one in which the main topic or central focus of the article was either a specific humanistic or scientific discipline or the concept of the humanities or science itself. So what you see on the slide is the results of our classification experiments, just a simple experiment. What we found is that there are over four times as many articles about science than articles about the humanities in our data. And again, this data is made up of newspaper articles from mainstream and campus newspapers over the past 20 years or so. We also found that 7% of humanities keywords articles are articles containing the word humanities. Just 7% of those are actually about the humanities. And it's a similar statistic for science. So about 10% of science keywords articles or articles containing the word science or sciences are about science. Now, of course, when you're, when you're dealing with keywords, um, you know, we're missing a lot of stuff that might be about the humanities or about science, but doesn't necessarily contain those words. I mean, so that's a sort of limitation that we talk more about in the piece. Okay, so what happens, this slide is about what happens when we look only at articles that were classified as being about the humanities or about science. That's what this table is showing. So here we're organizing our data, not by keyword, but by type of source. So we found the majority of articles classified as being about the humanities are from student newspapers, 91%, which makes sense. Um, uh, we also found it, that this was similar with articles about science, the majority of articles classif uh, classified as being about science are also from student newspapers, although it's slightly less. Um, these numbers suggest that student newspapers are more likely to publish articles about either science or the humanities than top newspapers. That makes sense. We might expect student newspapers to publish more articles about academics than mainstream newspapers. That makes sense. However, if you compare the numbers of articles about the humanities and about science published in each type of source to one another, so if you compare student newspapers to top newspapers, we see that articles about the humanities are disproportionately underrepresented in top newspapers and overrepresented in student newspapers. So we just did a simple chi square test for independence to do these comparisons, and it's pretty clear that there's a relationship between the subject of an article whether it's about the humanities or science and the kind of source it's published in. And top newspapers tend to publish even fewer articles about the humanities than we would expect given the distribution of articles in our source types. That's what this slide is showing here. Our data also reflects differences between campus communities. So as this table shows, the majority of articles classified as being about the humanities from student newspapers are from newspapers of private institutions. If we look at a list of the 10 student newspapers that contribute the most articles to the humanities category or that publish the most articles about the humanities, we see that these articles frequently appear in newspapers of some of the nation's wealthiest and most elite private institutions. So uh, institutions like Stanford, Dartmouth, Harvard, Princeton, and Cornell all top the list of top sources for articles about the humanities. The situation's reversed when we examine articles that have been classified as being about science. The majority of these articles are from newspapers at public institutions and the 10 newspapers that contribute the most articles to the sciences category include papers from many large public research universities. So what does this mean? This difference suggests a correlation between the institutional support and relative prestige of the humanities disciplines at elite private schools and the appearance of articles about the humanities in the newspapers of those schools. Other scholars who work on the history of the humanities in the state of higher education in US today have emphasized, and here I'm quoting from a historian of education, Edward Ayers, that quote, the most exclusive and ex, um, expensive, the more exclusive and expensive the college or university, the more established the relative position of the humanities. 
and our data reflects the extent to which even public discourse about the humanities is privatized or at least centralized within the most exclusive campus communities in the United States. Okay, we wanted to examine contents of articles about the humanities and compare them to articles about science in order to understand what is, what is discourse about the humanities. So what these tables are showing are the results of a Wilcoxon rank sum test to compare articles about the humanities to articles about science. This test compares distributions of values such as word frequencies to one another, determine if there's a significant difference between the two, between two populations. And if so, what characterizes this difference? When used to compare word frequencies, it can show you sort of what are the most distinctive words that belong to a particular category of texts, or what are the words that are most likely to appear in one group or more likely to appear in one group as compared to another. These tables are just showing the top 10 most distinctive words for each group, articles about the humanities and articles about science. Um, frequency here refers to the terms relative frequency per 500 terms, percentage increase is about the percentage increase in use of that term in articles about the humanities as compared to articles about the sciences and the Wilcoxon statistic is a measure of how distinctive that term is. Um, we tested a random selection of 500 documents from each category um, and all the comparisons listed here have p-values below 1 to the 10 to the negative 12. Um, so the words that are most distinctive to articles about the humanities are associated as we can see with education and specifically with education as it is situated within institutions of higher education. Words like students, courses, education, college, majors, and other ones in the top 20 include department, academic, university, and faculty occur more frequently in articles about the humanities than they do in articles about science. In contrast, a list of words most distinctive to articles about the sciences includes researchers, data, and lab. So this doesn't mean that articles about the humanities don't talk about research though at all. They just do it differently. So we also use topic modeling to explore articles about the humanities um, in some more detail. And what we found um, is that uh, uh, while discussions of the humanities and discussions of science share some common features, we saw that these discussions have different rhetorical relationships to public research communication and they invoke different audiences associated with different institutions. So what we saw is that articles about the humanities operate through what we call a double layer of communication. Discussions of science are much more concrete and direct in the public, in the public imagination, often featuring direct descriptions of specific scientific breakthroughs and findings. You can see some examples in the headlines in the image here. Scientists discover that is the sort of template. Newspaper articles about the humanities also discuss humanities research and scholarship, but in much less direct ways. They tend to mediate research through descriptions of events and classes that foreground an audience of attendees or students in addition to the implied audience of newspaper readers. And so to access the research that's communicated in these newspaper articles about the humanities, the reader must do so through the sort of mediation of these audiences that the articles talk about. This double layer of communication effectively embeds the public within the sort of discursive structure of the humanities, emphasizing access and encouraging participation, and sort of bringing humanities research to life by describing how actual people, what they do with it. There's a lot more to say about these articles and about this category, um, but by way of closing, I want to talk about a sort of final weird category of articles that we examined. As I mentioned previously, the vast majority of our data is not about the humanities or science. Instead, most of the articles in our corpus contain um, incidental mentions of these terms. So articles containing the word humanities, but that our classifier didn't categorize as being about the humanities, which you can see sort of circled on this slide. Um, in, these articles include incidental mentions of the term. So they might include the term humanities in the name of a building, the title of a professorship or the listing of an event. These kinds of articles outnumber articles about the humanities in our data by a factor of 11. So they're, they're much more frequent. And so we wanted to learn more about these kinds of articles which aren't normally included in discussions of how the humanities are discussed in public for the obvious reason that they are not about the humanities. They're about other things. 
but they just contain this word. So again, this is part of our um, idea here is to just follow the word humanities around and see where it leads us. So article is not about the humanities, but that contain this word. And we, we use the phrase humanities public discourse to describe these articles in the, in the article. These articles contain more frequent, what we call event language. Words such as day, family, week, children, city, local, and free are also in the top 20. So what we're, what we're seeing on this slide is a list of the top 10 most distinctive words and articles that contain humanities keywords, but that are not about the humanities. These words, such as day, family, week, children, often occur in event announcements, particularly announcements about municip municipal and regional arts events, museum exhibits, and readings at a local bookstore, indicating a broad range of sort of different types of publics that are interacting with the humanities beyond university walls. When we examined another topic model of about 27,000 articles containing of, of this time of this type, so articles that contain the word that aren't about the humanities, um, we found that a large number of these topics also include uh, a large number of topics in this model also include event language. This kind of language is also associated with announcements of momentous life events, such as a wedding announcement or an obituary. Articles like this will often contain the word humanities in reference to um, the educations and professions of couples who are getting married and their families. Um, and in several topics made up of obituaries, humanities organizations are often noted as a preferred recipient of donations made in honor of the deceased. Um, it's also, it was also interesting to us that um, in comparison to what I said about how humanities research is communicated indirectly in newspaper articles, that does not hold true for obituaries. So obituaries are one of the few places, one of the few types of articles that we found that communicate the work of humanities scholars and their research directly to a public. Of course, they're communicating that directly at the moment when the person who did that research has died. So it's just interesting that the, that the obituary is a genre that goes against the trend that we saw about how humanities research is communicated. There's a lot more I could say here, but to wrap up, I'll say that broadly speaking, these articles register how the humanities inform and shape the experiences of many different kinds of publics, from museum goers to children in a summer camp to attendees of a wedding or a funeral. These kinds of like event oriented and local articles that document ordinary life and work happening in and through and all around the humanities are evidence of how the humanities, even when they aren't explicitly conceptualized as such, become part of the background of everyday life. These results are part of our sort of larger argument that the meaning of the humanities itself is much broader and more expansive than many scholars or humanities professionals often realize. While many scholars and professionals like to separate the humanities as a group of scholarly fields or as an administrative formation, like to separate them out from creative endeavors like the arts or from indexes of human flourishing and life events like wedding announcements or obituaries, we make the case that if you look not at a particular definition or way of understanding the humanities, but rather just follow the word around in public discourse, you can come to new understandings about how the humanities are valued today. To bring this back around to the title of my talk and in conclusion, I think this is one thing that understanding text as data can do. It can help us as, human, as humanists, as humanity scholars to change our frame of reference, to investigate new sources of previously ignored documents such as newspaper articles that no one wants to read through um, at larger scales that is, than is possible with non-computational methods. And when we do this, we can come to new understandings, I think, about our culture. All right, thanks, that's the talk. Excellent, thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, one of the things that I miss in Zoom, and I, I think we all do, is they're, they're, if we were in the same room, you, you'd feel that sense of, that was fun, thank you. We make noise with our hands, just like that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Very nicely done. Um, I, 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 my job as moderator is not to ask questions, but it's also to make sure that we don't waste the time that we have. So while participants here are framing a question, uh, I'm, I'll ask one that, that follows from your last remarks about, about the 
the very idea of the humanities. We, we have labels, and in fact, in computational linguistics, how you tag something, actually tag has a new meaning, doesn't it? Uh, how you label a text or a component of a text and what your, what your process is for deciding how to do so is an interesting proposition. And, and what you've been saying makes me wonder whether or not the label, the, the meta labels like humanities uh, are doing the work we once thought that they were able to do. Uh, you know, what, I can, you're, you're in a metadata scientist series, right? I mean, one could plausibly say, it doesn't matter how you got your background, that what you're doing is data science about something else. And so what's, talk a little bit more about what you think the utility of these labels is, especially for the academy, where if, if you're a dean or, or a provost, I reckon, you're trying to grapple with this. What ought to be our mission when the labels we use to divide up our stuff are not holding up very well anymore? Yeah, and you're talking about the labels specifically like humanities versus science, right? For example, um, for example. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's been a ton of scholarship in the humanities on the development of the humanities as a concept and as a for administrative formation within the US university. And so many scholars, most scholars I would say, understand that now, understand that phrase, the humanities, to be a primarily administrative one because it's hard to define the humanities without resorting to administrative university formations. Well, what are the humanities? Well, they're the fields that exist um, under particular administrative formations within a college, right? Or there are a particular set of departments that have understood themselves to be the humanities. And so a lot of scholars have argued that the humanities are primarily administrative. It's an administrative concept. And we see that in our data for sure. The humanities articles are associated with the language, as I said, of administration and particularly the language of administration within university institutions of higher education. So that is true. But I think one thing that our research shows, I hope, is that um, the humanities are yes, administrative, but they're not only or even primarily administrative as soon as you change your frame of reference to think not just about the university, but about also what happens outside of the university. Um, and there's often this sort of divide. I think lots of people think about the university as being a separate, being separate from the public. And the public is like an abstract entity. We don't really know who they are. They're out there somewhere, right? We're not sure who we're talking to when we're talking to the public. Um, but what we tried to do in our article is to break down that distinction a little bit and to argue that the univer university audiences are one kind of public and people who read newspapers, mainstream newspapers are another kind of public. And so I think what, just to answer your question, one thing that our research shows is that these categories, whether it's the humanities and sciences or what have you, um, only sort of exist it, exist in particular ways because you're looking at them in particular ways. And when you change your frame of reference, they themselves will start to change as well. Um. We spoke often talk about the, the, sometimes the value of scholarship is making ever fine distinctions. Sometimes collapsing them can be useful as well. If your view of the academy is a bunch of pointy headed boffins with their texts and their molecules uh, being let loose on an innocent public. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it might be that that's not the right way to be thinking about it. Well, it's, it's one way, but it's not the only way, right? And I think, the, yeah. Well, a thousand flowers bloom, right? Um, well, uh, normally there's not a shy group there, but they're being thoughtful today. By the way, you forget, so, so to, to go off of your title a little bit more, one could argue, and I know some philosophers have argued this, that what, what count, that anything can be done data, right? Uh, I don't know if you all see the same screen I do. I see Professor Champney from Cell Biology. His image is a cairn, a stack of stones to, 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 you'd have on a roadside to guide the path, right? Well, that's, that's data too, right? Or is that a kind of a text? In other words, when we start thinking about all, all of the ways we communicate, what, what are we to make of, of, of that sort of thing? I didn't mean for you to go away, Tom, where to go? Yeah. I think I saw it. Yeah. Oh, uh, Tommy, you've, you've taken <laughs> away my example. I'll bring it back again. <laughs> there it's it better is. to see the yeah. cairn. <laughs> well, that's so. Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. I mean, speaking at it again from the humanities side, side scholars in the humanities have long argued that 
everything is a text. And this, you know, began the sort of post so-called postmodern turn in the humanities fields with critical theory in the 1970s and 80s. And so we have a long tradition in the humanities of thinking of thinking about everything as a text because you can read and interpret anything as if it's a text, right? And so it's sort of interesting to me to think about how does that tradition of thinking about many different kinds of things as texts overlap with existing traditions in data science, other fields, what have you, of thinking about many different kinds of things as data. Um, and what are the differences and distinctions between those terms? A lot of times, though not always, but a lot of times it falls down on who's, uh, who's digesting the text for the data. Is it a human that's digesting the text for a data? Or is it a computer? And I think sometimes the distinctions can be made that way, but not always. And the metaphoric power of it all is delicious, right? Because you just described <laughs> the gastrointestinal system as, like, as, as not entirely uh, unlike a, a, a kind of an analytic program. <laughs> and um, I have one question, if you I mind. Um, have case. you looked at the, the modifiers uh, that come next to the words that you are looking and whether those are linked somehow to something. Yeah, so you're talking about so, like words like humanity is the context in which it appears, is that? Or adjectives before them or after them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are lots of ways that you could approach that. We That wasn't one of our primary concerns in this piece. And so we, we mainly addressed it through human reading of topic models, which is to say we use topic modeling, which show you uh, words that are associated with each other within particular documents. And so by using a topic model, you're able to see, okay, the word humanities appears next to words like faculty, students, et cetera, but it also appears next to things like arts, uh, book. Um, also it appears next to things like teacher. And so you can sort of see those, those different groups of words separated out. And topic modeling also allows you then to dive in deeper, if you will, and read, actually read specific articles that contribute to particular topics. And so we use the topic modeling to guide are just human reading of a lot, a great number of these articles. But there are many things that one could do. There are, you know, using word windows and other types of analyses that would take uh, the uh, sort of associative links between words more into account at a computational level. But we decided to go with topic modeling. Thanks, Dean Backus. Let me um, ask you this one. There's, well, there's I see, I see a question. Oh, go ahead. Oh, oh, go What's ahead. That? You've got it. I was going to say, I see a question in the chat here. Um, uh, I'm a PhD student in public health science who recently learned about data humanities, interested in about the possibility of being involved. Any advice on how I could get started? Really good question, George. Um, as I said, finding formal training in this is difficult. It can be difficult. There are a number of um, summer institutes, the main one in the humanities being the Digital Humanities Summer Institute, which is held every year, although it's been virtual the, the past two years at um, the University of Victoria in Canada. And they offer courses, either one week or two week intensive courses for teaching people um, about the digital humanities. Now, many of those courses are created with an audience in mind of humanists who want to learn more about doing technical stuff. But there are, there are also some courses that are more sort of um, interdisciplinary and more about teaching people from other fields what the digital humanities is. And so I would say, if you have the chance, and if you're looking for more formal training opportunities, that's a good um, place. I'd also be happy if you sent me an email to, to, to give you some more ideas. Um, but yeah, great question. And in fact, in fact mm -hmm. go ahead. So I have, I have, I guess, a, a comment and, and a question. The comment is um, that last week we were also talking about how everything is data. And, then you can <laughs> and this week we're talking about how everything is, um, everything is text, right? Everything can be seen through, through those lenses. And I think something that's jumping out at me right now is that when you try to encode um, whatever it is that you're looking at as data, right? You end up making certain assumptions, right? You end up um, interpreting it, interpreting whatever the text form of it would be from a very specific lens. Mm -hmm. And that bias is, is, is encoded in the nature of whatever variable you come up with, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a, I think, a really interesting uh, point because it's also pointing out that 
in all other disciplines, right? Not necessarily just the digital humanities. There is this, there is this how we see the world is encoded in the variables that we have chosen to treat as, as truth, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that I think that's a that's a really interesting point, right? Our, our different disciplines bringing in, like, coming from genomics, I'm saying everything is data. Coming from the humanities, you're saying everything is text. Um, yeah. So maybe comment on that, and then I, I can also I have a question regarding more technical question for you. Yeah. Sure. I mean, <laughs> it's a difficult point. I think part of as I said in an earlier point in the talk, a huge tradition in the humanities, in the digital humanities, but also just in history and literary studies and many humanities fields is thinking about how the categories that we use to organize knowledge became the categories that we use to organize knowledge. And so that's where the history of science approaches that I think have been really influential and important for a lot of digital humanities work come into play because what those scholars ask us to consider over and over again is, why are you organizing things in this particular way? What assumptions are you making when you're, um, when you're organizing data or text in a particular way? What assumptions are you naturalizing? What are you taking for granted that maybe you shouldn't be taking for granted? And I think that's a, um, a huge contribution of the humanities to data science, if you will, is to ask people who analyze and collect and organize data to think really critically about the categories they use to organize the knowledge that they produce. I wonder if there's, you know, if, if, if um, there's an approach where we can um, sort of see the variety of ways that you could organize uh, that knowledge about that particular thing that you're interested in, right? And then see yeah. what the, so what are the variances there, right? What, how are yeah. you using, yes. using that variety of definitions coming yes. up to different conclusions, right, as, as a way yes. to and I'm sure that this would also vary by application. Absolutely. So if you try to do this for, um, yes. for more context, it wouldn't be the same as another. Yes. Yeah, the authors of this book that I mentioned actually take readers through a, several case studies where they do just that. Um, and, and they're very aware of the fact that, you know, the categories that you decide on will affect outcomes, but also of, of this like sort of the other way around that to get the outcomes that you want, sometimes you have to decide on categories that are maybe a little bit problematic, right? And so they, they think about that interchange a lot. But yeah, this is a great book as a starting place for that. And this book also, I will say, was written with an audience of data scientists primarily in mind. Um, it's written for humanists, but also really data scientists. Just, just a, a brief uh, comment. I don't think that when we talked about this, what Athena was saying is that, um, you know, text is data. Image is data too, right? So, and that has to do with how humans, we perceive the world. We will perceive it through language, you know, and written forms. We also perceive it with our eyes, right? Mm -hmm. So these are the, uh, this is all kind of uh, uh, types, I would say, of the different perceptions. And now we are teaching the machines right? Yes. To, to view the world the same yes. way, like yes. we humans, right? Yes. So that's, yeah. uh, I, I would look at it that way, right? And we have, yeah. you know, everything, you know, it has to do, you know, teaching the machines of how we humans process data, whether yes. it's text, images, you know, any other kind of form of data that primarily images and you know, and but we also have smell, right? So we have other mm -hmm. kinds of perceptions of data as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a great point. I mean, that's exactly what we were doing just in a simplified form with our text classification is teaching the computer to different, to replicate our judgments about what is an article about the humanities and what is an article about science. Um, Nick, I think you've come up with a new concept called nasal analytics. <laughs> I would be a great name for a band. <laughs> Lindsay, there's a question. There's there's a question from Tom. By the way, just forgive me the emo moment, but but we have colleagues, we have we have a dean of arts and sciences, a colleague in cell biology, somebody from Rasmus, and that's what we do when we're at it, and a, and a bunch of people interested in computer science. But Tom Tom asked the question, uh, I don't know if you see it in chat, uh, about about thoughts related to 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 text messages, which have become yeah. A, 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 a medium in themselves. Any thoughts, uh, by the way, we need to be wrapping up in a few minutes. Yeah, sure. I mean, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm, I'm not as familiar with work that's been done on text messaging. One thing that I, th I think is a point of connection to the work that we did 
is that I imagine, although I could be wrong, that getting a hold of text messaging data directly from companies that own that data could be difficult. And one of the problems that we ran into on our project is the fact that we were contracting with LexisNexis that owns all of this data. Um, and they restrict access in a wide variety of ways. And so we have made our data sets available to the public, but we can't make the plain text available. It's all under copyright. We can only make transformed versions available. Um, and so this type of corporate ownership of data really impedes research and scholarship. And it's a huge problem for those of us who work in more contemporary fields post in the humanities post 1923 for copyright laws. I um, mean, it's a huge issue that, um, that we're gonna be facing in the future moving forward. So you'll forgive me because that sounds like a really good topic for our dialogues and research ethics when, when, when um, otherwise perhaps legitimate corporate interests interfere with the research mission, then yes. perhaps we're at cross purposes with each other. So I might, I might, uh, I might try and trick you into doing, doing uh, one of those talks. Dean Bacchus, you've turned on your camera. You, want, uh, you and Nick want final words? No, I was going to say that uh, when uh, also thinking about algorithms, algorithms are like sentences, right? So that's another way to to make that connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you can and you can read them and their outcomes in particular ways as you can sentences. Um, I also see just one more question in the chat. If I if there's time, um, uh, go for it. Take take your time, but hurry up. Uh, sure. <laughs> so. Um, RS Canada has asked, I'm curious as the, about the tools that were used to gather and do the analysis of data and then about any big surprises that made you say, wow. So the data collection, as I said, we did it through LexisNexis's API, but we wrote our own custom Python script to interact with the API. Unfortunately, two years through our project, LexisNexis changed their API entirely. And so we had to stop data collection because we did not have the resources to continue collecting data at that point. We also created our own custom social media scrapers to get data from Reddit, Reddit's database and from Twitter um, and from a TV, uh, an archive of TV news transcripts online. So that was all done in a custom way. And for analysis, we used mainly free open source text uh, tools such as Mallet for topic modeling, um, a variety of you know algorithms and so forth for text mining from Python packages like sklearn. We did everything in Python, um, Jupyter Notebooks, our, our workspaces created it's a series of interlinked Jupyter notebooks. This is before we started working on before book Jupyter book came out. Um, that people that that allows our methods and analyses to be reproducible. That was the main idea. Um, and then any big surprises during analysis? Yes, a lot of big surprises. One main one was the thing I mentioned about the obituaries being perhaps the only site of direct communication of humanities researcher scholarship in newspaper discourse. There's a ton of newspaper articles that are about how scientists have discovered something, uh, exoplanets, uh, viruses, what have you, how scientists have developed new techniques or technologies, but that kind of direct communication of research and impact only happens for, human for the humanities really in things like obituaries. And that for us was like very weird and interesting to think about the obituaries as a site of research communication. And especially as we as we were going through COVID these past couple of years. Related to a question I just saw in chat, namely the impact and results during the pandemic. Yeah, I mean the, the main thing there is that um, it was harder for us to to get together and do our research every summer in the past before the pandemic. We had all gotten together in Santa Barbara for uh, six weeks to do research together, and we could not do that during our final year of the grant period. We also had a significant impacts in terms of RA work and the hours that people were could work or were available to work. And so we ended up getting a six month extension from the grant just because of various things need wrapping up that, yeah. Um, but one, one of the hazards of shout outs is that you always skip somebody while I was emoting about the interdisciplinary nature of this. I've lost, I missed our colleague, Professor Fruchtin from the law school. Um, on that happy note, um, uh, before we thank you officially and make more noise with our hands, I just want to mention that uh, the next uh, event in this series, October 28 at 4 p.m. is Kim Grinfelder, uh, Director of Interactive Media Program at UM. Uh, and we look forward to see, ah, well done. Someone shared a slide there to do that. Um, and on that note, uh, I want to thank you. Nick, do you want to have a final word? On that note then, Lindsay, thank you much for uh, very much for a wonderful presentation. I look forward to seeing more of this work 
and to continue all of our really interesting and important collaborations. On behalf of IDIS, thank you all so very much for being here. Thank you. Thanks very thank much. You. Thank you all. Bye. Bye-bye. Great talking.